Produced by Marion Clare, written and directed by Jack LaFondre, conducted by Robert Trendler, Mutual presents the Chicago Theater of the Air Summer Concert Hour, a gala hour of music and song sincerely dedicated to better radio listening for your entire family. Featured highlight of this summer series is the career performance of a new vocal artist each week, a great opportunity for deserving young singers to start professional radio careers. Our stars this evening are Virginia Parker and Bruce Foote, our speaker, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, and our career performance guest, baritone Bernard Izzo. The Chicago Theater of the Air Summer Concert Hour. There's music in the air on this summer night, which by deliberate coincidence reminds us of a melodic operetta by the late Jerome Kern. From the Music in the Air score, here are three of the great hit tunes. I've told every little star, there's a hill beyond the hill, and the song is you. Virginia Parker, Bruce Foot, the chorus and the orchestra. Scenes from Music in the Air. I make up things to say on my way to you, on my way to you. I can write poems too when you're far away. When you're far away, I write poems too. But when you are near, my throat goes dry. When you are near, I only sigh. I've told. How sweet I think you are Why haven't I told you I told ripples in a brook Made my heart an open book Why haven't I told you Friends ask me am I in love I always answer yes Can be a wonderful world when the thrill of adventure comes. You don't like the kind of things at home until you find. Today can be a wonderful day when you're out on the open road. There is no road too long to walk if you can see it. 
Our young soprano star of this summer night, Virginia Parker. Hers is a song made famous by the late Grace Moore and many other stars of yesteryear. A song destined to remain famous forevermore. Cheery beery bean. Many of the great arias from George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess bear titles that are more than song titles. They're actually bits of homespun philosophy. Here's a vivid example as sung by the distinguished American baritone, Bruce Foote. A woman is a sometimes thing. Shame and 
Can't you blame you till your woman comes to claim you? Yes, a woman is a sometime fee. Yes, a woman is a sometime fee. During the months that preceded Army Day, last April 6th, the first Army Song Contest in the nation's history was conducted under the supervision of Major General Russell B. Reynolds, Chief of Special Services, Department of the Army. This contest was open to all members of the U.S. Armed Forces and United States civilians and was conducted on a worldwide basis. A total of 1,050 songs was entered and judged in preliminary command-level contests in the United States and overseas. Of these, 112 songs reached the music section of Army Special Services in Washington, D.C. for final selection. First prize, a $1,000 United States savings bond, went to Vaughn Monroe for his song, Men of the Army. Second prize, a $500 United States savings bond, went to Thomas J. Phyllis of Chicago, for his entry titled, It's the Army. It is our pleasure and privilege at this time to introduce this winner of second prize to our coast-to-coast -coast audience. It's the Army by Thomas J. Phyllis. Thank you. 
Tonight, at Wheaton, Illinois, a group of close friends is giving a birthday party for Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. To be an American newspaper man is to assume day in, day out, year in, year out, defense of our sacred American creed. It is to uphold this creed in spite of all personal criticism and in defiance of powerful interests and factions that constantly seek to revise it for their own selfish gain. To be an American newspaper man is to shoulder a vast public trust and to execute that trust in behalf of but one gilt-edged commodity. That commodity is Americanism. Americanism is the dauntless spirit that set forth in a cockle-shell boat with gossamer sails and spanned 3,000 miles of horizonless ocean in search of religious tolerance. It is to rise up in common assembly and offer death as a cheap price for liberty. It is to see a loved one struck down in a rustic churchyard, heart pierced by a savage arrow. It's to march on bloody feet through sub-zero, razor-sharp ice in an endless valley forge winter. It's to fall in mortal combat on the slopes of Bunker Hill and the fields of Trenton, to strangle in the fluttering halyards of a square-rigged clipper ship, to perish in the smothering alkali dust of the Alamo to be torn into anonymous bits of ragged flesh at Bull Run. Americanism is the spirit of a tall, gaunt man with bowed head who, on the hallowed ground of Gettysburg, poured out the hopes and the cares in the very heart of a nation. Americanism is to storm the jaws of hell at Argonne and Cantigny, to roar flaming out of a smoke-filled heaven into a holocaust of slaughter, 
Americanism is the composite of all things American. To wage an eternal crusade in the cause of man's inalienable rights, no matter what the cost. Tonight, on his birthday, we extend our sincere congratulations and gratitude to a newspaper man who has assumed his great trust without fear and may be depended upon throughout all his days on earth to uphold our sacred American creed above all other things. That man is Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Ladies and gentlemen, since Colonel McCormick is not with us tonight, his historic weekly commentary has been specially transcribed for this broadcast. His subject, the Battle of Bull Run, Colonel Robert R. McCormick. We have seen how Washington was secured and Maryland cleared. A General Lyon freed Missouri of Confederate troops, and Lieutenant William Norson of the Navy got possession of Kentucky. General Lew Wallace freed the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and compelled Johnson to abandon Harper's Ferry and retreat to Winchester. In the meanwhile, oblivious of the valley situation, the Confederate Army, driven from Alexandria, had been gathering around Manassas Junction. Thus, there were Confederate armies at Winchester and Manassas, connected by several roads through the mountains, and two Union armies at Harper's Ferry and Alexandria, on the southern shore of the Potomac opposite Washington. It was at this time that the Confederate General Cock first pointed out to General Lee how the two Confederate armies might con concentrate at one point or the other. Once when it was planned for Patterson to attack Johnston at Harper's Ferry, Scott considered the necessity of detaining Beauregard at Manassas, but made no preparations to do so. When Johnston failed to stand at Harper's Ferry and Patterson refused to pursue him into Virginia, the plan occurred to Lincoln and Scott to attack the Confederate Army at Manassas. Scott informed Patterson of this plan and ordered him to defeat or detain Johnston in the Shenandoah Valley or consider marching by Keyes Ferry and Leesburg to join McDonald. General Scott had had much experience with the difficulties of converging attacks in the War of 1812. He had, moreover, what was lacking in the previous war, telegraphic communication. He should have given specific orders to Patterson. He did not. He did not even tell Patterson what day he intended to advance. Patterson, however, advanced to Martinsburg, where he was joined by Lew Wallace's regiment, but not by a Pennsylvania brigade at Cumberland. He then pushed on to Bunker Hill and planned to attack Winchester but was dissuaded by his chief of staff, Fitz John Porter, and Colonel, later General, George H. Thomas, who advised him that his line was faulty and that he should move to Charlestown. Unaware that McDowell was then marching on Manassas, he accepted this advice and moved on Charlestown July 17th. Johnson's army of four brigades, including Jackson's brigade, left Winchester on July 18th. That night, the army crossed the Blue Ridge at Ashby's Gap. At dawn, the march continued to Piedmont Station on the Manassas Gap Railroad, where trains were waiting for the infantry. Cavalry, artillery, and wagons were moved by road. Jackson and his brigade reached Manassas Junction at 4 p.m. of the 19th, and Johnson himself on the 20th. By the 21st, the brigades of Jackson, Bartow, and B were on the field of battle. Kirby Smith's brigade was still en route, but arrived on the Union flank in time for decisive action in the afternoon of that day. Manassas lies some 25 miles south of Washington, easily reached by a high road through Santeville. McDowell's army left Washington on the 16th of July and reached Santeville the evening of the 18th, where a reconnaissance resulted in a skirmish of some consequence. He found that Beauregard, in command of the Confederate troops, had taken position behind the fords of Bull Run Creek. From his position on a commanding hill at Centerville, he could see all Beauregard's disposition. 
It's probably necessary to delay at Centerville over the 19th because of the confused condition of the supply train. But he could have fought the battle on the 20th, which was clearly desirable with Johnston known to be so close. He heard rumors that Johnston was coming from Winchester, but was not deterred. Scott had told him that if Johnston came from Winchester, Patterson would be on his heels. He planned to faint at the stone bridge on the main road and to cross the creek higher up and turn Beauregard's left flank. Beauregard, for his part, planned to turn McDowell's left flank and neglected to guard his own. Both armies were late in starting, but the Union forces were first. They crossed the channel successfully beyond the Confederate left flank and began rolling it up. Fortunately for the Confederates, their right flank had not gotten into action. It was therefore withdrawn and reinforced the main army at a fortuitously strong position to which the main army had been driven. Faced by these reinforcements, the Union advance was stopped. And while the issue was in doubt, Kirby Smith's brigade, the rear guard of Johnston's force, arrived from the Shenandoah Valley on the right flank of the Union Army. In the face of the entire Confederate Army, the Union advance lost momentum. The order to advance being persisted in, the Federal troops were tired of their own motion, and the officers remaining behind, the men largely fell into disorder. A number of sightseers rushed to the rear, followed by the Teamsters, who cut their horses from the wagons, and they in turn were followed by the most panic-stricken of the soldiers. Undoubtedly, the desire to get within the fortifications of Washington served to hurry the retreating troops. This brings up the old controversy, fortification versus no fortifications. Without the Washington forts as a goal, the army might have stopped at Centerville. On the other hand, without fortifications, a panic-stricken government might have abandoned Washington. Beauregard's two battalions of cavalry attempted to pursue, but were not strong enough to disrupt the Union rear guard. The Confederate infantry, in turn, was too tired and disorganized by the battle to more than hold their ground, and awaited in trepidation a resumption of the attack on the morrow. An account of the battle by an English correspondent named Russell, who did not see it, was written in the typical British style to create specific impression regardless of facts. The implication of the peculiar name of Bull Run and of the strange willingness on the part of the North to accept the worst construction of all battles combined to give the impression of a terrible defeat. And this, in turn, has been attributed to untrained troops. Too much emphasis has been placed upon the alleged lack of training of the troops. As we have seen before, the Massachusetts troops have been training since January and the other New England troops have been training almost as long. There are a number of regiments of long standing, and as we know, quite a number of independent companies. The, the Zouaves, in particular, were better drilled than the regulars. There were troops of different nationalities, the 69th New York and Irish Regiment, the 79th New York's dress uniform was Highland kilts, some Cincinnati troops were German. There were a number of soldiers who had been trained in the German army, there had been, however, a neglect on the part of General Scott to organize his army, and brigades were not formed until just about time to start from Manassas. There were other panics much later in the war, notably those of Bragg's army at Chattanooga in 63 and of Sheridan's army at Cedar Creek in 64. Much had been said about political influences which compelled the advance. Clearly, an advance at that time was proper. The time of the three months' volunteers was expiring. If they were not used in July, no attack could be undertaken until the new army had been drilled and organized. The attack would in all probability have succeeded if Patterson's army had been ordered either to attack Johnston at Winchester or to advance through the mountain gaps to Centerville. A victory would have cleared the south bank of the Potomac at least, at most have led to the occupation of Richmond and the extension of the government of West Virginia over the whole state. As it was, the three-month troops went home, and the new army enlisted for three years of the war did not move until the following February. As wars always do, this one brought 
hitherto unknown figures into high position. On the Union side, McDowell, Sumner, Rosecrans, McClellan, Hunter, Franklin, Howard, Sykes, Wilcox, and Buell were to demonstrate their unfitness. On the Confederate side, Johnson, Early, Lee, Stewart, A.P. Hill, and Longstreet were to learn the secrets of the labyrinth of the Valley of Virginia and continue to win victories until confronted by two geniuses as yet unknown. Speaking by a special transcription, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, has been heard in another historic review, presented as a public service feature of the Chicago Theater of the Air. Free copies of tonight's discussion of the Battle of Bull Run may be obtained by writing to the Mutual Broadcasting System, Chicago 11, Illinois. Again, the combined voices of our brilliant stars of this summer night, Virginia Parker and Bruce Foote, from Jerome Kern's unforgettable showboat, You Are Love. gentlemen, the weekly featured highlight of the Chicago Theater of the Air Summer Concert Hour, Career Performance. <laughs> this is the thrilling moment in each of these Summer Concert Hours, when a new vocal discovery steps before our microphones to make a coast-to-coast -coast bid for future stardom, a first major network career performance. 
The most successful of these new career performance artists, as judged by your letters and postcards, may well become your favorite radio and television personalities in the years that lie ahead. Your comments are very important to these artists and will reach us care of the Mutual Broadcasting System, Chicago 11, Illinois. Here to present the career performance of this evening's new vocal discovery is our first lady of the Chicago Theater of the Air, Miss Marion Clare. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Back in 1945, a weekly Sunday afternoon studio concert went on the air, featuring Bernard Izzo baritone. But we doubt whether many listeners in this country heard those concerts, for the station was WVTQ, operated by the armed forces at Osaka, Japan. However, two years later, in 1947, a limited American audience did hear a program of songs by Bernard Izzo over station WRFM at Tiffin, Ohio. There, Mr. Izzo attended Heidelberg College both before and after his service with the armed forces and was graduated with a degree of Bachelor of Music. This year, he completed postgraduate work at the American Conservatory of Music here in Chicago and has received his master's degree. Mr. Izzo is 25 years old, a native of Rochester, New York, now living in Chicago. In spite of the handicap brought about by the war, he has steadfastly pursued the singing career he outlined for himself as far back as his high school days in the late 30s. He has supported his educational ambitions by singing, directing choirs, and other musical assignments. Withal, he found time to play varsity football, both in high school and college. For his years, Bernard is a boast a well-rounded musical education, a valuable background for any aspiring vocalist. Tonight, he bids for national recognition, as this is to be his first major network appearance. As he gives this all-important career performance, he has our best wishes for his future success. First this evening, Mr. Izzo is to sing Di Provenza il Mar from Verdi's La Traviata. Bernard Izzo. <laughs> Ma se al fin ti trovan cor 
Di Provenza il Mar, from Verdi's La Traviata, presented as the first work in the career performance of baritone Bernard Izzo. As an encore, Mr. Izzo will sing one of the great hit songs from the Desert Song by Romberg, One Alone. Gentlemen, we have presented the career performance of baritone Bernard Izzo. Next week, our career performance guest is to be tenor Lawrence White. We hope you'll plan on participating. For your invaluable help in shaping the careers of these deserving young artists, thank you sincerely. Thank you, Marion Clare and Bernard Izzo. Again, our galaxy of summer stars. Memoirs of George Gershwin constitute a great Chicago theater of the air finale. 
Love is sweeping the country, The Man I Love, Embraceable You, and The Song of the Flame. Virginia Parker, Bruce Foote, Robert Trendler, The Chorus and the Orchestra. Memoirs of Gershwin.
such bright light that is beckoning. Oh, the night it is beckoning. On, 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 on. Take the new day of reckoning. What new fire is it drawing you? Conducted by Robert Trendler, written and directed by Jack LaFondre, this has been the Chicago Theater of the Air Summer Concert Hour, sincerely dedicated to good radio listening for every member of your family. Virginia Parker and Bruce Foote, and our speaker, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Our career performance guest was Bernard Izzo. Your opinions of Mr. Izzo's work will reach us care of the Mutual Broadcasting System, Chicago 11, Illinois. One week from tonight, our stars will be Nancy Carr and Bruce Foote, our conductor, Henry Weber, and our career performance guest, Lawrence White. This is Lee Bennett speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.